Welcome to the series Speaking Up for Point Malate, in which invited speakers uh, will address key questions and issues about Point Malate, and members of the public can ask questions. We'd like to begin this program by recognizing that we are gathered on unceded Ohlone land. For thousands of years, the Lishan Ohlone people have lived on the land that's now known as the East Bay, including Point Malate. In their own words, they did not own the land, they belonged to the land. We recognize the importance of this land to the Ohlone people past and present and, and, uh, and invite you to join us in learning more about and honoring the Lijan Ohlone history and work today. Our speakers for the series speak for 30 to 40 minutes, then we'll answer questions. Please limit your questions to uh, one minute. We invite sincere questions asked with courtesy and respect. Inappropriate behavior will cause removal from the meeting. Also, please use the chat to let us know how we can improve or to leave your email so that we can contact you with announcements directly. All chat will appear in the recording. I'll put the web page for the speaker series into the chat. This session and future sessions will be recorded and posted at that, on that page. Um, in the meantime, you can go to the Speaking Up YouTube channel for recordings of all sessions. Next week's speaker is the Watershed Project. Um, they will be speaking on nature-based solutions for shorelines. I'm Pam Stello. I'm co-chair of the Point Melody Alliance and the Richmond Shoreline Alliance. And I serve on the board of directors for the Citizens for East Shore Parks. I live in Richmond. I'm a co-host of this series with Sally Tobin. Sally's a biologist and a retiree of the Stanford Center for Biomedical Ethics. She works with the Point Melody Alliance and the Richmond Shoreline Alliance and is a member of the Bay Area Sea Kayakers. She serves on the Board of Citizens for East Shore Parks and she lives in Richmond. Sally, raise your hand, please. Thanks. Our Zoom administrator is Danny Zaki. Danny is the Bay Shoreline organizer for the San Francisco, San Francisco Bay chapter of the Sierra Club. Danny, please wait. This week, we're very pleased to have Allison Young, who's speaking on Point Melody's marine biodiversity. Allison is co-director of the Center for Biodiversity and Community Science at the California Academy of Sciences, where she works to build partnerships and community around nature and sharing knowledge about biodiversity. Allison, along with colleagues at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles, leads the annual City Nature Challenge, one of the largest community science events in the world collaborating with people around the globe to share biodiversity observations in and around urban areas. She and her co-director also run Snapshot Cal Coast, a yearly campaign to mobilize the public to document species along the California coastline. Allison's background's in marine biology. She holds a master's in biology from Humboldt State University for research focused on the potential effects of climate change on California's rocky intertidal communities and a BA in biology from Swarthmore. When she's not in tide pools for work, she can often be found in the tide pools for fun, photographing nudibranchs, which she then overshares on social media. <laughs> it's I'll, turn it over. <laughs> I'll turn it over to Allison now. Great, thanks so much, Pam. All right, I'm going to share my screen so that you all can see. There we go. Can you all see my presentation now? Title page. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about the marine biodiversity of Point Malati um, and also kind of just giving a pitch for why documenting species is important, like why we at the Cal Academy are really interested in getting people to document um, the species they find wherever they are, um, whether they're in urban areas or out on the coast or anywhere around the globe. 
Um, a little background first. Uh, so this is me and my co-director. Um, we co-direct what, what's called the Center for Biodiversity and Community Science. Um, if you've heard of community science or citizen science, you know, it's about uh, working with the public to answer, you know, scientific questions, to do research, to do science, basically. Um, both of us are marine biologists, though, and so when we are starting our community science program, gosh, like, 10 years ago now, 11 years ago now, um, we really wanted to have a marine component. So a way for people to kind of connect with marine, marine biodiversity by going out and documenting marine biodiversity uh, with us. Uh, and so we started doing some community science out on the outer coast um, in, in tide pools. We started off um, at Pillar Point, which is near Half Moon Bay. It's where the Maverick Surf Contest happens, if you've heard of that. Um, and we've been doing um, some long-term monitoring there and documenting biodiversity with volunteers there now for, for 10 years. Um, and it through kind of the work of our volunteers, it is the site along the California coast that is probably best understood for biodiversity now, even though when we first started working there, there wasn't even a species list um, for that particular reef. Um, mm -hmm. So kind of the power of community science. Um, and we've expanded our work since then to actually do kind of an annual event where we get people out along the entire California coast from Oregon down to Mexico. It's like two weeks every summer to document their local coastal biodiversity um, through working in partnership and um, you know having partners hold events and get the word out and get people out to the coast as well. Um, and so that's kind of where uh, the marine side of our community science comes in. It's really been focused very much on the, on the outer coast of California. Um, but a few years ago, um, the Treasure Island Development Authority, also known as TIDA, actually asked my co-director Rebecca and I to do um, intertidal and eelgrass surveys of Yerba Buena Island. Um, as you might know, Yerba Buena Island and Treasure Island are going are undergoing um, a lot of development right now, um, but Tida is really committed to doing, you know, doing sustainable development and making sure that they are um, keeping track of and, you know, watching out for and protecting the biodiversity, um, especially on Yerba Buena Island, since it is a natural island in San Francisco Bay. Um, so for a couple years from gosh, 2019 until 2021, um, we were doing intertidal surveys. So kind of intertidal is that area that's exposed during the low tide um, to understand what the biodiversity was um, in and around Yerba Buena Island and then doing some eelgrass surveys primarily through um, that little ROV that you see in that third picture there, um, going and taking kind of video through eelgrass and seeing and also kind of like over the edge of the boat and just seeing what's in the eelgrass as well. Um, so that like over the last couple of years, while I'm, I'm super familiar with like outer coast species, I've learned a lot more about bay species as well, because um, there is some overlap um, also. And so uh, that has kind of extended our work into other places in San Francisco Bay as well. So to kind of um, situate Point Melati, um, you know, like what makes Point Melati interesting um, in terms of marine biodiversity, like where, it, where it's situated in the bay and kind of like, why are we interested in Point Melati um, in general? Um, so part of that is just kind of understanding the currents and the marine influence that it might get. Um, you can imagine when we were working on Yerba Buena Island, that's directly across from the Golden Gate, the opening of the Golden Gate. So it gets a lot of marine influence. Uh, but if we look at the um, currents, around, hopefully you all can see that little video that's going right there that kind of shows the currents um, going in and out of uh, the Golden Gate, um, kind of during tidal fluxes. You can see that, you know, the area around Point Melati gets a lot of currents going by it. It gets a lot of like marine influence and things coming down from the Delta as well. So there's a lot of mixing of the water um, in that area, which means like to us, like it means there could be some really interesting things that are there, like both marine influence things and bay influence things um, might be found in a place like Point Melati where you're getting influence of both, both of those through currents. Um, another really interesting thing about Point Melati is that it does have natural rock habitat. Um, this kind of shows the remaining natural rock habitat in San Francisco Bay. A lot of the natural rock habitat has either been uh, filled over in San Francisco Bay, um, or it's actually been removed, you know, things that were considered hazards for ships. A lot of natural rock in the bay was actually removed as well. Um, and so um, if we kind of zoom in 
um, on Point Melati there, you can see that there are still areas of Point Melati that have natural rock. And for us, the reason that natural rock is really interesting is because like, like I said, one, it's super rare in San Francisco Bay. Um, and two, that a lot of the species that would be coming from the outer coast, the marine influence species, a lot of them only like to live on natural hard rock, not like the riprap or little boulders that kind of turn, um, you know, in, in the big waves and things like that, that they really only like those natural rocky points. And so if you want to look at like, where are those places on Point Melati? Um, this little tiny natural rock point that's on the south end of Point Melati Beach, um, that's a place where we find natural rock. Um, if we go farther north, there's other areas too, kind of those points that stick out into the water that have natural rock around the edges. Like those are going to be the places that have kind of the more interesting um, marine species um, coming from the outer coast. And that's the places that they would live. Um, so that's another reason that Point Melati is potentially interesting kind of from a marine biodiversity standpoint. Um, and then I'm sure a lot of you know about um, eelgrass in, in uh, Point Melody, that, that photo is not loading. I'm sorry about that. There was a photo there <laughs> um, that kind of showed the extent, but I'm sure you all know that there is very extensive eelgrass beds right off of Point Melody as well. And eelgrass is, um, you know, a kind of a nursery for a lot of species. A lot of things um, will grow up in, in eelgrass beds and then kind of ex expand their range outward from there. Um, so having such extensive eelgrass beds around Point Melody is just another reason that it's kind of interesting from marine, a marine standpoint. Um, and you can actually see this photo, you can actually see kind of the, the, that brown area along the shore are eelgrass beds. Um, off, this is a Point Melody Beach Park. Um, you can kind of see it on these aerial views. Um, but kind of the place that my co-director Rebecca and I are the most interested is the fact that Point Melody does actually have um, exposed intertidal areas. So this is uh, Point Melody Beach Park during a high tide. Um, but if we look at it, here's an aerial view during a low tide, you can see all that intertidal area, especially down at the south end. Um, that gets exposed during the low tide. And this is the area that my co-director and I, that we know the best, um, you know, that we decided that we could come out and it would be interesting to us to see what was out there and like bring the public along and have them help us document um, what species that we found in these intertidal areas um, of Point Melati. Um, and so here's Point Melati Beach Park at a really early morning low tide. I think this was probably taken around a little bit, maybe around 5.30 in the morning, 5.45 in the morning during a low tide um, last year. Um, and you can see kind of all that exposed intertidal area. A lot of that um, is mud, um, kind of a hard area to search, but there are places in there that have harder substrate and rocks and things like that that we can look at. And so here's another photo from a low tide, um, a little easier to see. And so although we aren't going out wading super far out into that mud, because if you've ever gotten stuck in that mud, you know, it's very hard to get yourself unstuck from that mud. You kind of you can buy special like mud wading shoes, but we don't have those um, kind of like big like snow snowshoes almost, but for mud. Um, but you can see on either side of those photos that there are kind of these rockier kind of harder substrate areas as well. Um, and so what we have done through doing some bio blitzes, some low tide bio blitzes out there is basically ask folks to come and join us during low tides. And let's search these kind of rocky, let's search the beach, see what's kind of washed up on the beach. Let's search these, um, you know, these, har these harder substrates, these rocky areas that where we can look under rocks um, and see what creatures are living in those areas. Um, and then also like we do go down to like the points as well, the rocky points like there's that you actually, you might be able to see there's people down there at that rocky point. Um, and so we go down, we go, we go look through those rocky points also, um, which are easier to navigate when it's a low tide to see what's living in those spots as well. So um, we've held two, uh, low tide or two intertidal bio blitzes at Point Melati Beach, um, in particular Point Melati Beach Park. Um, we held one last year in September of 2021, um, where you can see we asked people to document the species that they find using iNaturalist. Hopefully you're familiar with iNaturalist because I'm not going in on this talk like into what iNaturalist is and how to use it. Um, but if you're not familiar with it, I definitely recommend that you check it out. Um, but basically folks document the species that they find using iNaturalist. It's nice because you don't need to know what it is that you found. You you just have to take a decent enough photo that either the artificial intelligence on iNaturalist or the community on iNaturalist can help you identify what it is that you saw. So in our September bio blitz, you can see we had 628 observations of 145 species that were made by 28 people. And then the bio blitz that we just held last month, um, we had over 700 observations of 165 species made by 41 people as well. Um, and so awesome. these, are, these are all up on iNaturalist right now. Um, 
and allows us to look back and kind of see what what have people been finding? What, what did we find? What did other folks find um, in these tidal, intertidal areas of Point Blondy um, Beach Park? Um, so that's going to be kind of the first part that I go into. Like, yeah, what species are found in the intertidal of Point Blondy um, Beach Park? And, you know, like I said, we're documenting, you know, kind of between those two biases, we've documented over 200 species. I'm not going to go through all 200 of those species. What I'm going to do here is kind of give you a very high level view. Um, what are the kind of the more common species that we've been finding in the in, in the intertidal um, of those areas, species that um, are interesting for a particular reason? Um, and I will be talking about both native and introduced species. I'm sure you all realize and know that uh, San Francisco Bay is highly invaded, um, that it is totally expected to find introduced species um, at Point Melati, um, although we definitely find a lot of native species there as well. So as I go through and kind of talk about um, species that we're finding kind of in these larger groups, I'll uh, make it clear which ones are native and which ones are um, introduced as well as we go through. Um, so like I said, kind of looking at big groups, I'm going to do things like what crustaceans are we finding, what mollusks, which are like clams and snails and things like that, like what uh like cnidarians which are like anemones and jellyfish and stuff like that so kind of these bigger groups that i'll go through um that we found um over time so starting with crustaceans um because this is a group that we find a lot of representation of um at point melati um these are some of the most common native crustaceans that we find out there um all crabs we have these two shore crabs that are on the left the yellow shore crab and the striped shore crab um and then on the right what we call um like cancridae or cancer crabs. Uh, we have the Pacific rock crab and Dungeness crab um, that we've been finding at Point Melati Beach Park. And for the yellow shore crab and then the, the rock crab and the Dungeness crab, these are all species that we tend to find them the most, especially the yellow, the yellow shore crab, but the other two also, like as we're kind of looking in that muddy area underneath rocks, like, like the hide underneath those rocks, and that's where we're finding them. That striped shore crab, though, that's more of an outer coast species that really only likes that natural rock habitat. Um, so it's cool to find it out on that, like the southern rocky point of Point Melati Beach Park as well, because that's um, its favorite habitat. It doesn't like kind of the muddy areas. It really likes kind of hiding in cracks and rocks and things like that. So that's a species that we really only find on those natural rock habitats at Point Melati. Looking at some of the more common introduced crust, introduced crustaceans that we find there, um, European green crabs, like this is like one of like the most common non-native species in San Francisco Bay. So it's not surprising that we find it at Point Melati at all because they are like everywhere in San Francisco Bay. Um, but we also have these, um, I mean, they're fun to find these shrimp, these little shrimp called oriental shrimp um, that are at Point Melati. And then these little tiny New Zealand burrowing isopods to give you a sense of scale in that photo that isopod is sitting in like the vertebrae of a fish. So very tiny, these little tiny isopods that we find out there. They're often, when you look under rocks, they often sometimes are kind of coating the under the underside of rocks out there as well. Um, so kind of our more common non-native um, cr crustaceans that we have out there. Um, mollusks, which again are like snails and clams, bivalves, um, slugs, things like that. Um, the mollusks that I get most excited about are the sea slugs that we have um, at Point Melati that we found out at Point Melati Beach Park. Um, this one, this hedgepeth sap sucker, um, is beautiful. You can see it's kind of a sparkly green color. We found so many of these. They were everywhere during our September bio blitz, um, the one that we did last year. Uh, we, we only found a couple of them during our July bio blitz, but we think it's because they, they're associated with the species of algae that tends to bloom after we've had like warmer weather and warmer water. And so we think September is a better time to find them than uh, July where the water hasn't been warm for very long yet. Um, but they're absolutely gorgeous. And so if you ever have a chance to go out during a low tide, kind of near the end of the summer or the beginning of fall, look for these really sparkly, gorgeous green sea slugs because they're just all over the place out there. Um, and this other sea slug, which is also beautiful, um, the Taylor's sea hare, which is actually associated with eelgrass. You can see how it like fits perfectly on that blade of eelgrass right there. And that's where they live. You find them actually crawling on the eelgrass um, out um, in eelgrass beds. But they do occasionally wash in with eelgrass. Um, or if you can get out to the eelgrass bed, during a low tide, they'll definitely find these beautiful sea hares um, out there in the eelgrass. Some of the other um, native mollusks that we found out there um, are Olympia oysters. It's great to find native oysters in, anywhere in San Francisco Bay because for so long we were importing um, Atlantic oysters and that's actually how we got so many non-native species into San Francisco Bay. They came with the Atlantic oysters that people were farming in San Francisco Bay for a while. Um, so it's always nice to find native oysters. Um, 
And these mossy chitons, both of those especially are again, kind of underneath those rocks, kind of in the, in the intertidal area and the muddy area. California mussels though, again, are an outer coast species um, that really like that rocky habitat. They're, not, they're never gonna attach to little boulders um, in the intertidal that they only will be on those natural rocky points. Um, so again, a nice species to find kind of at those Southern rocky points of, of Point Melody Beach Park. Um, the introduced mollusks, like I still find them interesting and these ones especially because they are kind of like slug, slug like we're related to slugs. Um, these are actually both snails though. Um, they both have a very, very thin, thin little shell. Um, we have one called tortellini snails, which is just a fun name to have, but you can kind of see they have little like they're kind of folded over. They kind of look like little tortellinis um, or introduced species out there. And then these Japanese bubble snails also that have this really thin kind of bubble bubble snail shell. And um, they're actually quite lovely um, little creatures as well. They're just not native to, to California or San Francisco Bay. Um, a few other introduced mollusks that we find out there too, the Japanese little neck and the soft shelled clam are both species that tend to bury themselves in the mud. So we don't often find them live, but we do find their shells. Like when we ask people to like tell, tell people to document the stuff that's washed up on the beach, um, we often find their shells, which means that they're definitely living out in the mud flats um, around Point Melati as well. Um, Asian date mussels will actually attach to rocks themselves. Um, so we do tend to find them, we will find them alive, um, but just another um, non-native bivalve that we have that we found out at Point Melati. Um, cnidarians, which are things like jellyfish and anemones and corals are cnidarians. Um, not a lot of them at, at Point Melati. Um, we have found a couple um, uh, species of jellyfish that have washed up. Which does let us know that they're that they're traversing the area kind of probably just just offshore of Point Melati as well. So um, these are both native jellyfish, uh, the greater moon jelly and the Pacific sea nettle, both lovely species um, that we found washed up at Point Melati. Um, and this uh, non-native anemone, the striped green sea anemone, is really common, um, especially under the rocks um, at Point Melati as well. So if you're looking under there, you'll see these little tiny. They're usually kind of closed up. Um, when you lift them up, because they like they like to stay closed up if they're out of the water, but you'll find these little, little blobs that have kind of like a greenish tinge and an, and some orange stripes, um, and these are these little tiny striped green um, sea anemones that we find out there. Um, but on the whole, not too much um, cnidarian diversity, um, which is actually pretty consistent across the bay as well, um, unless you start looking at like harbors, like man-made hard substrates, and you tend to find other anemones also. Yeah. Um, some of my favorite features, which people kind of tend to overlook, is that we do have native annelids, um, specifically polychaetes, so native worms, and polychaetes are a type of worm that we have out there. You can imagine we also have like other, other types of worms out there, but polychaetes are the most common type of marine worm that we find um, out at Point Melati, and they're all really beautiful when you have a chance to look at them, but they're usually kind of crawling through the mud. You might see one when you lift up a rock, um, and so people don't quite tend to not know or notice how um, lovely they are. I sometimes don't even notice them at all. Um, but some of the native polychaetes that we have out there um, are these clam worms, which um, sometimes people will dig these up and use them for bait for fishing. Um, we have these lovely, um, we actually have two types of scale worms. We have 15 scaled worms and 18 scaled worms. And you figure out which one is which by basically counting, if you see my little laser pointer, counting these little circular scales on their back. And if they have 15 on one side, they're 15. If they have 18, they're an 18 scaled worm. Uh, but they're again, lovely and beautiful once you actually, I have a chance to see them and see how intricate they are. Um, and this paddle worm, I especially love, um, especially if you look up close that they do actually have like little paddles on their sides, um, kind of these round flat paddles um, down, the, down the sides of them instead of just the little um, kind of frilly uh, ones that we see uh, like on the clam worm or on the, on the scaled worm as well. Um, but some of the native, native uh, worms that we see out in the marine areas of Point Melati. Um, and in terms of sharks and rays and um, fishes, uh, fun fact, fishes is the plural of, of fish when you talk about multiple species. If you're talking about a group of fish that are all the same species, then they're fish. But if you're talking about different fishes, that means they're a bunch of different species. Um, this is why I'm putting fishes in here. Um, and so in terms of, of the sharks and the rays and the fishes, obviously when we're out there during low tide, we're not seeing a lot of, of any of these um, out in the out in the intertidal. They, they like to be out in the open water out there. Um, but that does mean though that we do send the, that when we document them, we're often documenting ones that have washed up onto shore. 
Um, but again, that does tell us that they're, they must be, you know, somewhere kind of swimming just offshore of Point Melati. So we've documented bat rays that have washed up at Point Melati Beach Park. Um, the stormback guitar fish was super exciting to find. Um, it's kind of one of the more rare ones. We don't often see it, um, but we found it washed up at Point Melati, which means at some point they probably are swimming by Point Melati. Um, this plain fin, plain fin midshipman, um, we actually found a live one at our last bio blitz, which was fun. It was kind of just like hanging out in the algae, trying to stay wet until the tide came back in. Um, but yeah, basically when we're, when we're documenting the fishes out there during a low tide, it's usually the ones that are washed up or kind of get stranded in the inner tidal and are trying to stay, trying to stay wet. Um, but other ways that we could document um, species, this was actually a leopard shark that were caught by fishermen. So we can ask fishermen to share with us what they found and, and document that and add that to the species list of the sharks and raging fishes out there. Um, the ospreys often do a good job of showing us which, what fish are out there as well. Um, this is a striped bass, which is actually an introduced species um, that was photographed that this osprey has. And there's actually quite a few other observations on iNaturalist of fishes in ospreys claws from Point Melati, since we know that there's a lot of ospreys out there. Um, so that's another way we can learn more about the fish um, that are kind of offshore Point Melati that we wouldn't see necessarily during a low tide. Um, and another um, introduced species that we do see out there is this yellowfin goby. This is one that um, we do will actually find in the inner tidal because they're small and you can lift up a rock and they're kind of just hanging out in the in the moist mud, muddy, like kind of wet mud under there, um, waiting for the tide to come back in um, at Point Melati as well. So um, that's kind of just an overview to kind of some of the more common marine species that we have found at Point Melati. Um, it's a really interesting spot, and I'm sure the more low, low tide and intertidal bio blitzes that we do, the more species we're going to add um, to that species list at Point Melati. Um, but that kind of takes us into my, the next part of my talk, which is like, why, why are we interested in having people document biodiversity um, at Point Melati? And like as the Cal Academy, why are we interested in, in having people document biodiversity anywhere? Um, you can see there's been quite a few. These are all the, the bio blitzes that have happened at Point Melati. This is all the projects in iNaturalist because they happen all using iNaturalist. Um, and so we initially got interested in Point Melati um, knowing that um, the Point Melati Alliance and Holy H2O had been doing a whole bunch of bio blitzes out there to document the biodiversity of this really interesting spot. Um, uh, especially the terrestrial biodiversity is where they had been focusing. Um, and my co-director and I were like, hey, you know, since we know the marine species, we could help out this process of really understanding the, the full biodiversity of Point Melati um, by holding some intertidal bio blitzes or low tide, low tide bio blitzes while we were, um, you know, during low tides and coming, getting people out there. So um, that's one of the reasons that we started doing low tide bio blitzes there. But like, what do bio blitzes tell us? Um, you know, why are we interested in having people do this? Well, one, like we get a species list, right? We can look on iNaturalist right now and we can see, um, you know, out, out of those almost 8,000 observations, or sorry, 5,000 observations that people have made that we've documented close, I mean, we're two away from 800 species that have been documented um, out of Point Melati, which is awesome. So it's just great to understand what's there now. Um, and there's lots of different reasons that could be interesting, um, but especially, uh, you know, to understand just like, what is the diversity of this place? Does it have a lot of diversity? Does it not? Obviously it has a lot of diversity, um, you know, and understanding just like understanding it in the context of the rest of the, of the Bay as well. So that's one reason we're interested in having people document species is just to like help us understand what species are where, um, you know, not just like in California as a whole, not even just in the Bay Area as a whole, but really specific places um, can be really important to document biodiversity. Um, looking at all those species too, we can also look and say, okay, which ones of those species are like rare or, thre or threatened or endangered? That's really important to know in places, especially as we're <coughs> trying, trying to protect species and manage them into the future. Um, so understanding the rare and endangered and threatened species that people have documented there um, is super important. It's also no, important to know what the introduced and the non-native species are that have been found in places, especially as we think about managing places into the future, like what are those species that we might try to like remove to let native biodiversity thrive, um, or what species are, you know, are there and are likely going to stay there. Those are all good things to, all good things to know. Um, you know, and especially at the Cal Academy, like why are we particularly interested in getting people to document biodiversity? Um, you know, like understanding your present biodiversity is a great way to connect to lo your local nature. It's a great way to understand the nature around you, to take the time to slow down and really see what's around you and document the, the species um, and learn more about them. But in particular, a place like the Cal Academy that has been, you know, based in San Francisco, we were founded in 1853. Our scientists, like the science of natural history at a natural history museum like ours, is to actually 
document biodiversity, like what species are where, uh, we tend to collect specimens. And that's what kind of what we do is we want, you know, go on out expeditions, we collect specimens, but have been doing that since 1853. And so not only are we interested in what's there now, but with our perspective, we can also look at what the past history of, Bi of Point Melati is. Um, and I just love this kind of aerial view of Point Melati. This is from uh, 1939, you know, kind of compare it to, to today and what it looked, looked like back then. Um, and in particular, uh, using iNaturalist is actually the exact same information that we have on any of our specimens in our collections. They're both what we call a species occurrence record. You know, so if you look at the label on a specimen, it's gonna say, you know, what is this species? Where was it found? When was it found? Like when was it collected? And who, who went out there and collected it? And that is the exact same information that's on an iNaturalist record, um, except instead of actually having a physical specimen, we have a photograph. Um, on iNaturalist. But what's really important is that we can use those data the exact same way. We can actually compare them and use them in like, um, you know, making analyses of biodiversity through time. Um, and so that's a really big reason why places like the Cal Academy are so interested in having people document their current biodiversity is that we can compare it to past biodiversity that we hold in our collections and other people hold in their collections as well. Um, and the great thing is, is that there is one central database called GBIF, or the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Uh, it's a handful of a name, makes it sound like it's a big building somewhere when really it's just a giant database. Um, but it basically is a huge database of species occurrence records. So it has iNaturalist records in it. It has like eBird records, which is another community science program. Um, it has collections from our museum, historic collections, collections from other museums, like universities, things like that as well. So this is a great central repository where you can actually, you know, if you're interested in a species and you wanna know where were people finding it in the past versus where are they finding it now, GBIF is the place that you would go. Um, and so the next portion of my talk, I actually have went to GBIF and kind of started mining GBIF to kind of understand like, what can we say about the past biodiversity um, of Point Melati? And so I'm gonna just give you a few examples of why it's interesting to know um, historic biodiversity in places. Um, so kind of the question I had was what was the past biodiversity of Point Melati and how does it compare to current biodiversity? Now, obviously people weren't going out and doing like full surveys of places in the past. The way that our curators and scientists work is they have like a, a, an organism that they are interested in or a group of organisms they're interested in. And they go out and they, they look for that organism and they collect it in the places that they find it. So, you know, it's not like we have a comprehensive species list from the past, but there are some interesting things that we can say, um, you know, look at things that were collected in the past and, and at Point Melati and compare it to what's been seen there, you know, it currently or since that time um, and see like, you know, are there species missing? Are there species that are still there? Are there species that seem like their ranges are changing? Things like that. So um, to start off with, I wanted to highlight um, this uh, specimen, um, which is was collected in 1909, Point Melati, um, and it was a specimen of an American bittern. Um, and I tried to kind of put down there at the bottom, like what the label on the specimen probably says. So it was collected January 5th, 1909. It was collected by a woman named Louise Kellogg. Um, it is currently residing in the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at UC Berkeley. Um, and what she wrote on the label, like for the location, because obviously they didn't have GPS back then, was Point Orient near Richmond. Um, and probably using her field notebooks, um, people since then have got a sense of where she was that day when she was out collecting and have put a pin, like they've actually given coordinates to their best guess to where she probably found this, um, which I you could put on that map right there, that map from... Um, Although she collected this before 1939, I don't have a map of what Point Melati looked like in 1909, so we'll just have to, you know, pretend. Um, but she collected an American bittern, um, a female American bittern, at Point Orient in 1909. And the great thing about specimens, too, is that, like, there's also really interesting stories um, that you can find out, like, you can learn more about the collector itself. Like, when I was looking into Louise Kellogg, I was like, who was Louise Kellogg? It turns out that she has a she had a classics degree from UC Berkeley, but got really interested in, you know, so she was basically kind of a, like a, a citizen scientist or community science scientist, got really interested in um, uh, natural history and collecting from a friend of hers, a woman um, named Annie something, I can't remember her last name right now, um, and basically spent the rest of her life going out and collecting and like describing new species and collecting specimens. Um, and we, there's one in the um, MVZ that she collected at Point Melati. And so looking kind of at current records in and around Point Melati, um, there have been 2,000 occurrence records in and around San Francisco Bay of American bitterns. Um, the earliest one is from uh, 1893, which is actually in our museum at the Academy. 
Um, the most recent occurrence records are all from eBird and iNaturalist um, from this very year. But if we look at Point Melati, if you kind of circle that area, interestingly, there actually hasn't been any records since that one in 1909 from Point Melati. So that's interesting to think about, you know, why are they not there? Was that one kind of a, a rare occurrence at that spot? Um, were they there and people just weren't documenting other ones there back, th back then on that day or back, you know, back in the day? Um, you know, as we think about kind of the future of this area, like, is this a species that we might want to try to figure out how can we get them back to places like Point Melati? Um, another uh, example, so here is a record from um, kind of the very tip uh, of a sand sole uh, that was actually collected March 26, 1912 um, by the U.S. Fish Commission, which is no longer the U.S. Fish Commission. It turned into like the U U.S. Fish Bureau, and now it's the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, but they were called the U.S. Fish Commission back in the day. Um, this is a specimen that's actually housed at our, our museum at the California Academy of Sciences. And when they collected it, the, if you look at the label, it says, it says, um, Brothers Lighthouse, 236 degrees, 0.33 miles. So I think they were saying from this point, this is where we found it. And so again, someone assigned a GPS point to it and basically put it right there at the um, tip of uh, San Pablo Point there. And again, kind of interesting history, this was collected from this ship right here called the USS Albatross, which actually the Academy used for years and years to do surveys in San Francisco Bay. And most of the specimens we collected back in like the late 1800s and early 1900s, we collected on the ship. Um, so kind of think about how, how cool it would have been to be back then in San Francisco Bay back then and see this amazing ship going by where people are collecting all sorts of stuff and they actually had laboratories on the ship. Um, so just kind of fun to think about, you know, what, what, what was going on back then when that one particular uh, sand sole was collected. And again, now if we go and kind of look at all the records from San Francisco Bay, um, there's records, those sand soles were uh, recorded and collected we with relative frequency up until about 19 the 1950s and then there's one record from 2005 one specimen um, from 2005 there's no no actual records from you know iNaturalist or anything like that um, and there's only about 30 records total in San Francisco Bay so it's interesting again and also if we look at kind of zero in on Point Melati there have been no other observations around Point Melati since that one that was collected you know so it's interesting to think is this is this just always a rare species in San Francisco Bay um, were they more common up until the 1950s and like we haven't had any other collections until, until 2005. Um, were people just not out looking for them in those like intervening 55 years right there? Um, and people on iNaturalist are less likely to find them just because they are a marine species. So like we don't have people regularly doing scuba diving surveys in San Francisco Bay and photographing what they find. So again, it's kind of interesting to think like, why was that species found then back then? And why are we not seeing it there now? Um, kind of one more record. Um, uh, thinking about things that, that used to be there that are not anymore. Um, there is a collection of a ringed neck snake um, on March 20th, 1925. The collector was W.J. Quinville. Um, this is a specimen that's housed at the Museum of uh, Vertebrate Zoology at UC Berkeley. Um, and on the label, it says San Pablo Point. Um, so again, this is the GPS point that was assigned to it by someone who either you know, just dropped a point and gave, gave their best guess or like maybe knew more about where this person was collecting that day and was able to assign a more accurate point to it um, as well. And interestingly enough, when I was kind of searching to see like who W.J. Quinville was, that actually he wasn't a scientist at, um, at UC Berkeley, at least not that I could find. Kind of doing a little historical research, I found an old phone book from the 1940s from the East Bay. Um, and there was a W.J. Quinville that was living in Oakland <laughs> from, the, from 1940 in the East Bay. So this also could have been kind of a citizen scientist or community scientist who collected it and brought it to the MVZ. And actually, back in the day, that was a really common way for museums and universities to get specimens was people who were just out there and found interesting things and brought them to the museum. Um, and the, the museum would accession it and it would become part of their collections. Um, I don't know why that box is there. Interesting. Oh, and my map, sorry, my map is not loading. Anyway, um, but I can tell you, though, that this is a species um, that there's been about uh, 475 other occurrences of this species in and around San Francisco Bay. About half of those are actual specimens that have been collected, half are iNaturalist observations. The earliest one is a collection that's actually in Harvard from 1871. Someone from Harvard was out here and collected it. Um, the earliest one that we have from the Academy from San Francisco Bay Area is from 1891. And the most recent is actually from this year. People found it and obviously documented on iNaturalist. So we see them still up to this day. Um, but if my map is loading, I could show you that um, 
that unfortunately they have not been found at Point Milati <laughs> since that one. And so again, this is another one as we think about like with the future of Point Milati, um, you know, why is the species not found there anymore um, going forward? Um, and then finally, I'm really sorry that these photos are not loading. I don't understand why. Um, so uh, the last one I wanted to highlight was a California Phasalia that was collected um, on March 19th, 1892 by Willis L. Jepson. And if you've ever heard of Jepson, like the Jepson Herbarium or the Jepson Manual, or you've taken any uh, Jepson courses at UC Berkeley, this was like the Jepson who was like famous in the botany world um, in California. Um, and he went and did some collecting um, on March 19th, 1892 in Portrero Hills, which are the, that hill line along Point Milati right there. Um, and so this is a specimen that's actually housed at UC Berkeley in the Jepson Herbaria. So the herbar herbarium that was named for him, um, he actually went out and made a collection on Point Milati. Um, and the great thing is they actually have a photo of that exact specimen. You can find it online and see that one that he collected um, from Point Milati um, that day in 1892 or whatever it was um, back in the day, um, which is pretty amazing that you can see that from, from so long ago. Um, and the nice thing is too, though, that like now if we look, so this is just a view on iNaturalist. If I look up California Phasalia on iNaturalist, there have been actually quite a few observations made of this species out of Point Milati. And this is a native species. Um, so, you know, this is, again, it's kind of nice to have that historical perspective to see like what species are still there? Like, is this, the species seems to be doing well. There's quite a few observations that have been made out there. Um, and so that's still hanging on and doing, doing fine out there at Point Milati, which is good to know. And so kind of in the end, like I think I really want to emphasize like why it's important to document biodiversity, why it's important to have museums that have these historic collections, but also why it's super important to go out and document current biodiversity is that we do, we can get this perspective on what the past biodiversity was of places. Um, we can get the perspective through people going out and documenting on iNaturalist because most, a lot of museums aren't doing as much collection as they used to, especially in places that have already been kind of pretty well, pretty well collected, like the California, the San Francisco Bay Area, but through people going out and documenting things like on iNaturalist and eBird and things like that as well, so that we can get a better understanding of what present biodiversity is, which we can then compare to past biodiversity. Um, and especially as you think about the future of a place like Point Milati, um, especially, you know, hopefully as East Bay Regional Parks turns it into a park and really thinks about how do we turn this into a place where not only the the current native biodiversity can thrive, but maybe we can think about like, what are those species that we potentially could bring back to a place, like reintroduce species that used to be in this place? Um, what are the steps that we need to take? Like having both that historic perspective and this current perspective um, is super important. It's why we are super dedicated to having people document current biodiversity um, at, the, at the California Academy of Sciences. Um, so with that, I will end my talk. I think I was in, within time um, and happy to take questions. Thank you, Allison. That was fascinating. And it's exciting, too, to think about the biodiversity and the potential for community science at Point Malate. Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn it over to Sally. She's going to lead the uh, Q&A. Oh, thank you, Pam. And uh, thank you, Allison. That was a great talk. Um, so people, if you would like to ask a question, please use the raise hand which is sometimes under reactions. For those on phones, I guess we don't have anybody on a phone, so I'm not gonna worry about directions for phones. Um, and again, we ask you to um, ask your question in one minute or less. And if you have comments, you're welcome to put them into the chat. And we love suggestions about how we can improve um, or uh, other helpful comments. So um, I see we have a question from Elsa Stevens. Elsa? When I think of a waterfront park open to the public where families go for picnics and volleyball and that sort of thing, um, I think of something like Chrissy Fields or um, I lived at for five years in Miami. So I'm thinking, when I think of the beach, I think of, you know, white sandy beaches and people going to in the water and stuff. I would hate to uh, disturb the um, eelgrass or, or um, when you showed us all these beautiful, wonderful creatures, I'm like, <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> But I was wondering if there's any corner of Point Mulati that can 
uh, accommodate that kind of recreation. The typical family, you know, make sand castles and that sort of thing. Yeah, you know, I mean, like there, there are the sandy beaches. Um, obviously, during low tide, it's harder to actually access the water. You know, so I think part of it is thinking about, um, you know, how making sure people know, like if they want to hang out on a sandy beach and dip their toes in the water, like going during a high tide, it's going to be an easier time to do it at Point Melati than during a low tide where you'd probably have to wade through a lot of mud uh, to actually get out to the water itself. Um, you know, in terms of like importing sand and putting it places like that's one of the things that you just want to be really careful about doing not only because you could like, again, kind of cover up that subtital habitat that has all these other, you know, native creatures, you definitely don't want to cover up the eelgrass. Um, but also just thinking about the currents in the bay is like, is that sand actually going to stay there, right? Like, why if there's not sand there now, like, why is that? And it might be because it's in a place that sand normally gets carried away from anyway. Um, and so, you know, not being um, an oceanography expert, especially within San Francisco Bay, I'm like, not quite capable to answer that question fully. Um, if there is a spot that could be turned into kind of a more like family friendly, nice sandy beach where you can go into the water, whether it's high tide or low tide. Um, because I would really want to understand like, yeah, the current, the better understand the currents around Point Melati and like kind of the transport, the sediment transport, which there's wonderful sediment transport models in San Francisco Bay. So that would be a place to start and look. Um, but I think part of it is just thinking also about like, I mean, there are sandy beaches there, but yes, during low tide, it's just not going to be as easy to, to, to actually enjoy, <laughs> be, actually be in the water, have your toes in the water at least. Um, but like, like I said, there's probably someone who could answer that question a, a little bit better than I could, but yeah, in terms of like not covering up habitat for other creatures, like not not a place that I know of, but maybe, maybe someone else knows. <laughs> thank you, Allison. Yeah. Um, uh, Alix has a question. Yeah, thank you for the beautiful presentation. Um, two questions, if I may. Uh, the first one, um, how does, uh, so the greater moon jelly and Pacific sea nettle, mm -hmm. Um, I often see them on the shore, you know, on the sand. Uh, do they, are they there because they're going to die or are they coming back? Or I'm just getting worried sometimes when I see them. So that's one question. Do, are they in the sand, but they're going to survive when the, the tide goes up again? And the second question, more generally speaking, uh, at Point Malade, as far as you know, are all the um, flora and fauna, are they more into a symbiosis kind of relationship or more uh, com competitive for space? Um, yeah, so the first question about seeing jellyfish up on the sand, you know, normally if they're on the sand, they are already dead. Like very rarely are they alive on the sand. They are, jellyfish generally are pelagic, which means like, you know, when mostly we think about plankton being pelagic, but like jellyfish, especially if it's a strong current or big waves, they cannot fight against that and they just go where the ocean takes them. But, um, you know, anytime if, you see, if you're seeing a lot of them up on the sand, um, much like plankton, jelly we have like blooms of jellyfish um where conditions are right and there will be like thousands of them so if you're seeing more than usual on the sand it probably means there's way more than usual that are also doing fine out there in the water as well um jellyfish are like not a creature generally we need to worry too much about because they will like very much like plankton they can bloom and like they just get carried places and so they might die off at some point but they come back um so uh, yeah, usually if you find one on the, on the sand though, it's probably already dead. Um, getting tumbled in the waves is not very good for jellyfish. They lose, they lose important parts. Um, in terms of uh, like uh, this, the species of Point Melati and if they're competing or if they're in symbiosis, you know, on the whole, there's, there's both things going on out there. Um, like almost in any ecosystem, you'll find species that, um, you know, like help ameliorate conditions for other species, like species like provide shade for other species that help them grow, you know, if they need a wetter area that like you can have that kind of facilitation of between species. Um, we see it a lot, especially in the intertidal, um, like things like having mussel beds out in the intertidal, like they facilitate so many species living down inside of them, same with eelgrass beds. Um, and you see it terrestrially as well. Um, and there's for sure competition happening also, and especially thinking about non-native species that don't necessarily have native um, consumers or native predators, those are the ones that like people tend to be most concerned about because they can actually outcompete native species that do have things that like have evolved to eat them and like evolved to, um, you know, 
I mean, basically eating them is like the main way that, um, especially thinking things about plants or insects or things like that. Um, and so competition, I think is, is more of an issue um, with non-native species yes. that can outcompete um, other species. Thank you, Allison. Yeah. Uh, Ellen Barth has a question. Uh, yes, actually uh, two. The shrimp that the Chinese used to catch, I think they were seasonal anandromous hermaphrodites. Do they exist anymore in the bay? And the second question is your bio blitz, was, were there no other um, sea plants collected? I know there's, there's sea lettuce and many other sorts. I didn't, I didn't see them identified. And I'm an old California Academy dice docent since the 1970s. There used to be in an old hall, a sea meadow exhibit of an enlarged uh, view of the various sea plants. So I do miss that. And I'm much obliged with your splendid um, knowledge of what else. I also wonder when I'm down by um, the Richmond Ferry, there is waving in the water there, something that is either eelgrass or some kind of seagrass. And maybe you can comment on how common that is. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I'll try to try to go through all of those. Um, the shrimp that the Chinese used to collect there, I'm not exactly sure. I'd have to look it up and see exactly what species it is. Um, there's a good chance it's still in San Francisco Bay. Um, but you know, we actually we have quite a few species of shrimp in San Francisco Bay. So there's a good chance that the one that they collected back in the day is still there, but I'd have to go and check and see what actual species it was. Um, but actually, you know, that's something that if you happen to, if you, if you happen to Google it and find out what species it was, you can even look on iNaturalist and see like in San Francisco Bay, have people, you know, doc have people documented it washing up on the beach or like, you know, when they're out tide pulling, if they, if they found it is another way to, to find out as well. Um, uh, for the question about, oh, other plants, um, other algae growing out there. Yes. There's like quite a few species of algae that grow, um, out at, Point, at least Point Melody Beach Park, which is where we've surveyed, knowing that like not as many people are as excited about algae, I just kind of left it out of the talk, but yes, <laughs> it takes the right, a special sort of personnel and like it's really excited about algae. So <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't put it in there for you. Um, but yes, there are quite a few species of algae that we have found growing out there. And especially that, um, that beautiful sea slug that I showed, the sap sucker, it really loves um, a species called Bryopsis that shows up in the, in the kind of later summer. Um, that's out there. There is the sea lettuce. There's quite a few reds, um, species of red algae that are out there also. Um, so definitely uh, interesting algal species um, out in around the area. Not as much as you see out, out on the outer coast, but still plenty of um, interesting species as well. Um, and in terms of what you would see, um, plants in the water around the Richmond Ferry, it's most likely eelgrass. You know, we have basically, there's three species of, of sea grasses that we have in the Bay Area, eelgrass being one of them, and then we have two surf grasses, um, both phyllospadix is the, is the genus. Um, but in this, in San Francisco Bay, it's going to be eelgrass. So if that's, if you're seeing, yeah, plants, um, you know, under the water by the ferry terminals, it's very, very likely eelgrass. It looks like it. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Allison. Um, and I think this has to be our last question from Jamin. Um, my question was just about, um, so a few weeks back, we had a, uh, a whale that washed up along the shore. Um, it wasn't quite Point Melati, but I was wondering um, what, uh, you know, the bio blitz obviously probably doesn't get whales very often, but what um, impact does uh, keeping Point Melati as a green and open space, how is that going to help with the whales that we have that do enter into the bay? And how often do we see their effects up here on, mm. uh, on the Point Melati area? Um, through whether what they're eating, they're, I watched a video that was far too long about whale poop, so I'm sure that probably <laughs> might really weigh in, but I, I think, I know that there's, uh, they have a big impact, and so I wonder what that might be up for this area. Yeah, you know, I think especially um, keeping Point Melati undeveloped, um, the main thing is that it's going to reduce the amount of runoff of things that go into the bay in that area as well. Um, you know, the whales that we get in the bay tend to be um, like the filter feeder, the ones that have baleen, and they're coming in for like krill and the other planktonic stuff that we have out there. Um, you know, so the more that we can keep stuff from entering the bay that would be a detriment to their food source, the more likely, you know, the better it is for the, for the whales, for sure. Um, and interestingly enough, like uh, I sit at, at the Cal Academy, I sit right next to the folks that actually run the Marine Mammal Stranding Network. So anytime a, a whale 
um, especially dead whales wash up they're actually the ones that respond and actually will go and, and try to figure out like why did this whale die and then we actually um, end up you know preserving some of it in our in our collections as well um, and so like I'm not sure I, I like not not being quite as familiar as uh, with their like historic data set I'm not sure how often I mean I remember back as a kid, we had the whale that went like all the way up the Delta. So they do actually do go by Point Melati for sure. I uh, think less often as they do just kind of come in underneath the Golden Gate and like swim by Chrissy Field and then kind of turn around and go back out again. Um, but for sure, there are definitely whales that must go up that way. Um, uh, and looking at their data might actually help kind of like elucidate how often they get up there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think in particular thinking about, um, you know, keeping uh, like, pollutants and toxins out of the bay development would also introduce a whole bunch of like sedimentation into the bay as well which is also not good like sedimentation then reduces eelgrass which then reduces like the things that like to live in and around the eelgrass as well like anytime we have a whole bunch of suspended sediment in the bay um, we see a huge decrease in eelgrass during those years um, and definitely development and things that are creating non-porous substrates which obviously concrete like everything just runs right off and takes the sediment along with them um, so yeah by uh keeping that area more open and more natural. That's another um, way that we're keeping things from entering the bay, like sediments and pollutions and stuff. So yeah, that would affect whales. Thank you, Allison. This has been really exciting. Um, and I'll turn it back to Pam. Thank you, Allison, for this inspiring presentation. Thank you everyone for attending. And we hope we see you next week for the Watershed Project. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs>